Well, this morning is going to be one of those presentations good. It's fantastic if you have attention deficit disorder because every 20 seconds they're going to try to click through and wake you up on the changes that are taking place in the capital markets. I was uh, two weeks ago at the SALT conference in Vegas. It's uh, predominantly alternative investments and hedge funds. And this past week I was in New York and I was at a um, CEO uh, sort of hedge fund presentation. And at the same time, I went to the big, uh, I was shocked by it, the Bitcoin uh, and all the cryptocurrencies and blockchain event in New York City. And I was telling Jay that I was just shocked because it was, uh, Rick will remember, at the um, Marquee Hotel, the Marriott. So it used to be packed for the gold show. Well, this is three times bigger. Uh, and so I'm going to try to walk you through to understand how things are changing quickly. Regulations is a big part in how it moves and morphs capital. But the hedge funds and the quants and how they look at gold stocks is totally different in my, my trips going around visiting gold analysts on the sell side. And what they think is working and selling, there's no audience. Uh, the bulk of the money last year went into the GDX and GDXJ. Uh, I would say something like $5 billion alone with the GDXJ. And then recently, uh, they found that they were going to own more than 20% of 20 companies, and they had to reposition and sell a bunch of juniors. So the whole industry, even if you had fantastic results last quarter, it didn't matter. There was $3 billion of headwind being sold into the marketplace. That provides you a good opportunity if you understand why it's being sold down. If you don't understand, you t t become frustrated and you just blow out your stock along with this sort of sell-side volume. That's how capital markets are switching and changing. And now we're going to start off with the Trump and dump bot. And this is happening in gold. And this is happening, and I've seen this, and I'll articulate it more. But let's watch this little clip here. Anytime a company mentions moving to Mexico or overseas or just doing something bad, he's on it. He tweets, the stock tanks. Tweet, tank. Tweet, tank. Tweet, tank. Everyone's talking about how to make sense of all this. T3 thought the unpredictability of it created a real opportunity. Meet the Trump and Dump automated trading platform. Trump and Dump is a bot powered by a complex algorithm that helps us short stocks ahead of the market. Here's how. Every time he tweets, the bot analyzes the tweet to see if a publicly traded company is mentioned. Then, the algorithm runs an instant sentiment analysis of the tweet in less than 20 milliseconds. It figures positive or negative. A negative tweet triggers the bot to short the stock. Like earlier this month, his Toyota tweet immediately tanked the stock, but the Trump and Dump bot was out ahead of the market. It shorted the second after his tweet. As the stock tanked, we closed our short, and we made a profit. Huge profit. Oh, and we donated our profits here. So now, when President Trump tweets, we save a puppy. It's the Trump and Dump automated trading platform. Twitter monitoring, sentiment analysis, complex algorithms, real-time stock trades. All fully automated. All in milliseconds. And all for a good cause from your friends at T3. Now this is happening in the gold space, and it happens in seconds that they were able to take a look at a country's currency, the South African Rand versus the South African gold stocks versus the dollar, and immediately a trade is being put on. It predominantly goes through the futures market, and where most of the gold manipulation takes place is predominantly through the futures market, especially when there's a holiday in China. Uh, China is now the, the global gold price maker, not the taker when it comes to gold. And it's recognizing how these capital markets change and form. And this past week, there was a Wall Street Journal story regarding the quants taking over. How many of you saw this article, taking over Wall Street? No one here? Well, look, Google it. Quants overtaking Wall Street, Wall Street Journal. Young kids uh, never did anything in finance. Is a Russian immigrant, uh, wins a, a, mass, a math competition and immediately his bid up and his base salary, Rick, is 700000 He's 21 years old. Uh, that's how this sort of world is changing, that they're looking for patterns. You take all this data and you try to take unconstructed data and then you try, look for a pattern and they can trade in, a min, in like basically a nanosecond. But they're looking at words and they're, and they're analyzing such as Trump has three words he likes to say as a, pro, as a, as a amplifying his, his, his adjectives is very, very, very. And the other one is really, really. The analysis has been done, he says very, very, very three times. This is analysis, and, and, and he says um, really, really twice. 
And most often he will say that it's because of a rich friend uh, or an important friend is his evidence of why he, you should listen to him. Uh, it's understanding that these quants have turned around and done this data mining and it creates short-term volatility, which can be to your favor if you understand why. This is a fantastic book. I highly recommend it. It's how your brain can think quickly and think slowly, process its left and right brain. Uh, Daniel Kahneman uh, is a Nobel uh, Laureate for his behavioral finance research. So what's happening today? So if information were the answer, we'd all be billionaires and have perfect abs. It was a sarcastic part in, the, in these presentations I've, I recently uh, heard. But what's happening to me is, is, is look at the data venture capitalists have been spending. You can see this number here. It's a, almost a billion dollars two years ago going into artificial intelligence and machine learning. And what is the difference I hope to walk you through? So machine learning is not about explicit programming processes. It's not like your bank account reconciles to a zero trial balance. It's more of a heuristic. When you were a kid and you learned to ride a bicycle, you didn't know the laws of physics to explain why you fell down. But you knew after time, it's called the tacit knowledge, you learned to balance yourself and 20 years later you get on a bicycle, you can still ride your bicycle because your brain, your brain has been able to process and create the neurons based on heuristics. And so now they're using this data, and we all take it for granted when we look at GPS, but GPS is all about using heuristics. It can't tell us ex exactly that Rick is nine feet away from me, but he can turn around and say he is within 30 feet of me, uh, if they're able to track the GPS or iPhones. It's recognized that they're looking at the stock market and data this way. So your path to deeper insight is machine learning is used to build everything. From, from voice recognition, which you take for granted, to cities and intelligent cars. And, and it's a big part of your intuition. They are looking for as many case studies of great wins in the stock market and great disasters. And they go back and analyze the words in all the press releases. And because everything has gone to the cloud, the cost of processing stuff has fallen 90%. That's the big, the, the, the advent of this breakout in artificial intelligence and Google's put a lot of money into it. Uh, it's because of the capacity of looking at the data, unconstructed data, and, and creating something constructive out of it. So the ability to operate in complex systems without having to articulate the procedures, like I said, riding a bicycle. So we operate, most of us operate in a set of approximate rules known as heuristics. It's how we function. And machine learning looks for patterns to produce approximation of rules. And machine learning requires a large, large, large set to produce strong intuition for complex system behaviors. They, the, the data is looking at every case study. And it, it, to me, it's most fascinating that there is more research in America on energy and oil fields and gas fields and data than there is on healthcare. And so the most successful companies have been applying this technology, and that's why fracking was able to explode, is because America's been a leader in data analysis. And now this is rolling into healthcare, and why most of us will live to over 100 years old, is being able to apply all this math to the data from, from all the food you eat, from your exercise, et cetera. So you think of this machine learning as designed to approximate your behaviors, and come, it's an imprecise, but as you can see, regarding words of the Trump bot, and this is real, that in, a t in, in one fifth of a second, it's able to go borrow from TD Waterhouse a stock and short it. So the software they say is eating the world, but machine learning is eating everything else. Now you take it for granted face recognition when you come through the airport, or voice recognition, and seismic imaging, they're all using machine learning. This tacit knowledge, along with inductive thinking and heuristics, is where the world's changing in analyzing stocks' words. It shocked me that 18 months ago, Janet Yellen had to come out and make a press release that the 250-page white paper had two words that were not supposed to be there, and the market immediately sold off. Now, how could anyone here read a white paper, 250 pages long, have a discussion, and go out and buy the market? The market was rallying. And one hour later, she came out and made this change, and immediately the market tanked. So these machines are reading words, and they're reading sentiment, and they're noticing how patterns are changing quickly. So Amazon, Netflix, Azure, IBM Watson, Google Predictions, they're all using this machine learning. So we take, a, like, we take a, the example, how many here have a um, uh, Amazon product? 
Anyone here? It's phenomenal, isn't it? It's just shocking, and, and prices just dropped again. And the same thing, how many here use their Siri with their iPhone? This is all machine learning, and it's only advancing. And right now, it's only about 93% accurate. And they believe the pattern is whenever you have this technology, it goes through 95%, the adoption process is now ubiquitous. It's everywhere in the world. So forecasting of weather has improved dramatically with machine learning, prices, and, and we just saw patterns and recognitions. Also for hacking, it's all of the machine learning is going in to prevent hacking and looking for patterns. How does it work? Well, you have a bunch of input da data, and you have algorithms that look for patterns. And these patterns could only be three minutes. And a lot of this high frequency trading is actually behind it is really high frequency research that says this information is only good for eight minutes or eight hours or eight days. And they call it the gamma. The information is, has a very short shelf life. And it's important to recognize this is what creates a lot of the short term volatility and it is very big in the resource sector. And this is Annie, our, it was called Advanced Neural Networking Investing. And it's a rise of the robo-asset allocation. And this is a process of driving down fees, but basically it's able to take a look at your, your emotional temperament. And everyone says, oh, I want to make 25% rate of return every year for the next five years. But they'll, if you, they won't, they'll say, well, the, the volatility could be plus or minus 50%. Well, that's okay, because I know I'm going to make 25%. So then they start doing psychological profiles and ask how often you've gone from zero to 60 in three seconds. They ask you, have you done bungee jumping? Because if you haven't done bungee jumping and you haven't done these other sort of personal experiences where you can deal with volatility, then you should not be taking those investments because you'll capitulate each time. So they now have to go through psychological profiles of you and ask words and words and descriptions, then they do patterns and they do grouping, and then all of a sudden they'll say, no, you should not be doing this, you should be looking at this asset class. That's how it's morphing. And if you take a look at a tree with no leaves on it, it's just like your neurons in your brain. And so that you're seeing that all the sciences, from biology, evolution, uh, you're, you're seeing every type of mathematical model on basic calculus and basic physics and basic biology and basic chemistry, so they're looking for what's an exothermic and endothermic reaction. If a molecule, a plus and a negative, has a reaction, does it give off energy or does it suck away energy? And how many of you have been to a room where you walk away exhilarated because you felt the other person's energy? And other times you've been in a room and you walk away with a headache because it took all your energy. Well, there are exothermic and endothermic reactions. They could turn around and take a look at data, and that's how the world's changing. And I think that this is what makes it exciting as long as you're aware of that. And these are classic examples of different types of neural networks. There's not one type of model with it. So you have statistics, you have databases, you have all these type of pattern recognition models that are out there today and they're upgrading every day. So quants are driving the gold stocks. So we can quickly see this Trump bot between gold, the currency, and the stock. And we can show this when we take a look at gold has surged this year, and why did not last year when gold surged 8.6%, a lot of the gold stocks jumped on average 40%, and the juniors advanced almost 100%. Why did that not happen this year? Because of the disruption of the GDX and GDXJ. And also the currencies. Last year, the currencies were wiped out in emerging markets, and this year they've had a rally. So this is calculated and recalibrated every 15 minutes every 15 minutes. So for you, and the whole purpose of this presentation is for you to walk away that you're not intimidated by volatility. It is your friend, if you understand it, and if you understand what's driving it. So we could take this, this sort of Rubik's Cube and look at production, cash flow, and reserves, and relative value, momentum, and event-driven, and look at words, and we've created a model that can process this faster than our competition. That's what we've done. And you can go back and look at different types of words and press releases, such as these types of words. And this was basically a research that took almost a year to do. And now you can process this stuff in hours. So if this word, one of these words happens, such as a project delay, on average the stock would fall 20%, it would take two weeks. Now it happens in two hours. Two hours. Well, who read it? How do they digest it? Where's it going? And this is the world of the quants. And this is a classic example that the GDX and GDXJ is $17 billion. 
and the fund flows have not gone into Rick's uh, open-ended funds, have not gone to ours, even though we won all these awards, again. In 2006, we had days of 50 million a day coming in. We're lucky we get $500,000 a day coming in. That's how the market has shifted, and everyone wants to be able to trade the GDX and GDXJ. And do you know what the dollar value of the triple, bear, and bull, and the GDX and GDXJ trade every day? Does anyone know here? Three and a half billion dollars every day. Short, long, long, short. And who's in, in that space predominantly? Not you, not the average gold investor, it's the quants. And it's recognizing they create this distortion in flows, just the same as the ETF structure has created distortion in fund flows. There's, and when you look at the GDX and GDXJ, it only cares about market cap. It doesn't care that this, this is a good property or a bad property, if this is good management or bad management. This is a safe country or an unsafe country or jurisdiction. It doesn't care. It's agnostic. It's just market cap and liquidity. And so I found that a lot of these junior mining producers have become lazy. So they figure they'll get the money through the G stocks will go up because of GDXJ and they don't have to talk to you, the investors. And they've lost that sort of retail component that's so significant because in ecology of the ocean, you just don't want to have whales like ourselves, our institutional buyers. You want to have minnows and you want to have tunas, and you want to have sharks are out there, and you want to have a complete ecology. And what's happened now is this ecology has been morphed for many reasons. So here's another example of looking at quant data. This is looking at the massive dilution of the GDXJ underlying holdings. So if we go back in the past four years, you can see that the GDXJ has issuing shares at a faster rate than the price of gold has gone up. So you've seen on, on whole 110% dilution. So that either the price of gold goes up 110% or these stocks fall on a relative basis. The quants process this immediately. They make a decision that's immediate and they look for factors where everything's on a per share basis. They don't give a hoot about how big your production is or your reserves are. They care about your reserves per share. They care about your price to book value per share. And, and it shows up in stock performance. So this is a classic example of looking at the difference of you taking the top 10 holdings and comparing it how you did with it. This is another example. We took the top 10 gold stocks with the highest revenue per share. So the price of gold went up last year 8.6%. What about the top 10 gold that protected the value over, over four years, not just one quarter? Those stocks, you can see here, doubled over four years. But what did the GDXJ do? It fell 50%. How many here have experienced 50% declines in their portfolio in gold stocks in the past four years? Right. Nobody? Come on. I know it's Sunday morning. I'm not the Catholic priest. You don't have to do the meal culpa with me. It's the reality. The reality, so the data says, if a CEO of a mining company destroys the value on a per share basis, they don't find more reserves of that cash or they don't increase the production, then their stocks get destroyed. But in the mutual fund world, we have to have a minimum of 21 names. So it's hard to find. So as soon as we start taking our data to go to 21, 25, 30 names, it becomes very difficult to actually get great performance. So you're forced with this diversification rule. But if you're an a individual investor, a concentrated portfolio focusing like this, you can have great alpha. You can do spectacularly well. So this is looking at the 10 precious metal stocks based on the highest revenue per share. And you can see Northern Star in Australia, some of the best performing gold stocks have been in Australia. And, and they've had phenomenal runs, phenomenal. And there's only two in the top 10 are Canadian. And then I take a look at another factor is SG&A to revenue. What's your expenses to your revenue? So the biggest significant factor that helps here is the currency. So if you're producing in South Africa and the currency falls by 50% and gold is flat, you're automatically going to have lower SG and revenue. Those stocks doubled. They went up 160%. Well, why did they do that? So it's, and I know in 2001, we were a number one gold fund. We were predominantly in South Africa because the currency had halved. Well, this, this sort of thought process is so much more rapid now in the world of quant analysis. And this is a look at revenue to SG&A, and just that we rebalance these top 10 names every quarter, and as you can see, in the first quarter, or take a look at this period, this is over four years, that you have 13% CAGR versus losing 8.6% a year. Another way that quants look at and rebalance is this is looking at all these different factors like cash flow return on invested capital. It's a key Warren Buffett tenet. 
And you can see you still outperform the GDXJ and the GDX by a wide, wide margin if you focus on those key factors on a per share basis. And the royalty companies have done spectacularly well because they have the highest revenue per employee. And we've noticed that when we look at technology companies, we look outside of that, those companies in any industry category that have the highest revenue per share attract more money. The other thing that's interesting is that they also have rising price to book value. And the quants don't care about NAVs. They don't care about NAVs. Every gold stock analyst, what do they sell you, Rick? Cheap NAV, right? This is a cheap relative NAV. They don't care. They're not, the fund flows are gonna look for, are you increasing your price to book on a relative basis? So this is a classic example of looking at the GDXJ and the dilution as of, compared to the royalty companies. And when the royalty companies go and dilute, they immediately buy something that has immediate cash flow. And that's another reason why they've outperformed in a dramatic way. So these, what I'm trying to show you here, and you can get all of them get this, these slides, is that is the system has changed and the factors have changed. And everything is about relative value on a per share basis. And so you as investors have to ask the question, what is these junior companies or producers to protect the value on a per share basis? And those stocks in a rising gold market will outperform. And this is a classic example of showing you book value of the four years. You can see the royalty company's price to book has been rising, whereas you see the other gold producers have been falling. And these are royalty companies showing superior stability, Franco Nevada, Royal Gold. So now we take a look at project rest. And what we found was that uh, most of these companies have NEVs that are saying, well, it's only 5% uh, discount rate. So this project that they say, is that is say a billion dollars. It's worth a billion dollars. But if you have a 5% discount rate, it's worth 600 million. If you use a 15% discount rate, it's only worth 250 million. But they wouldn't raise $600 million for something that really should be discounted at a 15% rate. And guess how much they wrote off? 600 minus $250 million. That's what they wrote off. So it's the, the, the quant world doesn't care about discount rates. So what's driving the price of gold? This is driving it. It's that love and fear trade, and it's predominantly the monetary policy, and there's no change. And it all has to do with negative real interest rates. I repeat this over and over and over, and Kitco has on their website to show you is that the dollar of the price of supply and demand of gold is driving the price of gold. In the U.S. terms, it is all negative interest rates. What's the number one thing that drives a Canadian dollar? Oil prices. It's the number one thing that drives the, the Russian ruble and the Norwegian krona. It's oil prices. It's recognizing what drives it. And so I just do this comparison on a regular basis to show investors that when, negative, when we had negative rates of 300 basis points, gold hit 1,900. Then they went plus 200 basis points, and then went back. And so what is negative interest rates? Every month, it gets recalibrated with a CPI number. So what is the government willing to attract, pay you to buy my five or 10-year government bond? I deduct the CPI number, which comes out every month. And if that return is negative, the price of gold is rising. If that return is positive, the price of gold is falling. And that science shows up over and over and over. So what are we in now? We're in a cyclical cycle for gold. Historically, gold bottoms in, in, at the beginning of Ramadan, and we get a run until Chinese New Year. Uh, and there'll be many corrections for it. So stay tuned for this. Understand that the volatility in the capital markets are your opportunity. Understand that a lot of the volatility is triggered by high-speed quant research. And now you know what the factors are looking for. And I wish you all um, buckets of happy investing. And I'll be speaking later today more detail about the ETFs and how Smart Beta is applying some of this technology to look at uh, investments. Thank you all for your patience and coming out early in the morning. <laughs>